Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're doing well. The book that I would like to talk with you about in this video is The Summing Up by Somerset Mom. Okay, so before getting to this book, I want to very briefly talk about a couple of other books that I'm reading. I don't have much time these days, but surprisingly, I've, uh, I'm in parallel reading a, a few books. Uh, one of them is In the Swarm by Byung Chul Han. This might not surprise you because I've been going through his writing. Uh, what I've found about Byung Chul Han is that I can't go through all of his body of work one after another, and I need a break. I need a break from his way of thinking, from his style of writing, even though I do believe he is an incredibly useful and enlightening writer for us in our time. He points out really crucial things facts or um, aspects of our life, how our life, our expressions, even our emotions have been shaped by the technologic, technological environment like digital media, like the internet. And the swarm is really about that, about digital media, social media in the internet age, how that shapes our, um, our or be, at least becomes a factor in shaping our consciousness and our expressions, how we channel ourselves, how we channel our thoughts, express our thoughts in this media. Uh, but I do need, need a break. I can't, and I wouldn't recommend going through all of, the all of Han's body of work one after another. You need a break. I need a break anyways. So uh, I am slowly working my way through this book. Um, I still see it as very valuable with my uh, reading group that meets every Sunday morning. We are still working our way through the basic uh, writings of Kant, Immanuel Kant, and we have made lots of progress. I'm really happy with how things have um, how things have gone. We are, believe it or not, we have reached, and now we are working uh, on critique of judgment. We discussed the first critique, the second critique, a couple of essays on enlightenment and history, the idea of history. Um, with cosmopolitan intent, uh, the groundwork um, for the metaphysic, metaphysics of morals or fundamental principles of the metaphysics of morals, and the second critique, and now we have reached the critique of judgment, the third critique. So that's another uh, collection I'm reading. Uh, and the other thing I'm reading is the memoirs of an Iranian woman, Iranian writer, playwright, uh, by the name Ezate, Ezat Gushegir. Ezat Gushegir is the, the Persian way of saying it. Ezat Gushegir uh, wrote a, a four-volume, I mean, it, it is recently published, I think it was last year or a couple of years ago, published in four volumes. And I am almost done with the first volume. Uh, these, are, these were written uh, beginning in 1986 and basically her memoirs during the first four years as an immigrant in the US. Uh, first a couple of months in Europe and then in the US in Iowa City and I've been really enjoying these. It's I, I love I love reading it I love living with her her thoughts her experiences her recorded daily, you know, challenges, daily reflections, uh, the friendships that she finds, people who let her down, people who surprise her pleasantly. So yeah, I'm looking forward to working my way slowly through the four volumes. And um, yeah, okay, so the summing up. The summing up. So this book, The Summing Up, has some qualities of an autobiography autobiography. I don't know why my pronunciation of that word became weird. <laughs> it has some qualities of an autobiography, and it has some qualities of a collection of essays on various topics. He announces, strangely enough, he announces in the beginning of the book that he is not interested in writing an autobiography because he has already used all of his significant life material in his fiction, in his published fictional works, novels, um, and maybe short stories. And another reason why he claims, another reason why 
he doesn't want to write an autobiography, he claims, uh, is that the fact that he has poor memory, at least he claims to have poor memory, so he wouldn't want to go through the effort of putting the pieces of his life together. Okay, but I think there's something else going on. At a deeper level, what he wants to do in this book is he wants to find a comfortable position, a comfortable relationship with language, with, how, with his style. He wants to adopt a style that is comfortable. And that comfort usually means that not strictly abiding by a set of rules or a specific genre like autobiography. Okay, So that's the idea. I think he announces that he's not doing that because he wants to do the thing that is that he finds um, to be the best fit. And to me, that is the main draw, the main attraction of Somerset Mom's writing. Since I have, since I've discovered him, thanks to my friend's recommendation, uh, the main attraction of his writing is how comforting and soothing his use of language is, which really reflects his way of thinking. One of the themes of this book, relatedly, to that soothing and comfortable style. One of the themes of the book is his development as an author, his trials and errors, how he tried to copy initially the styles of classic writers, writers that he admired. He wanted to write in their style and how he found that their style wouldn't suit him. How he turned to the study of medicine for, for a time, how he... Uh, how he begins to, how he began to write plays, how he finds or found success in as a playwright, and how he turns to writing novels eventually, novels and short stories. Another major theme in the book is the theme of acceptance, acceptance of his life and acceptance of life in general. Acceptance of life and all its imperfections, acceptance of one's place in life, like I'm not going to write like those people, no matter how good they are, how great they are. I'm not that. That's, that involves a, an acceptance. He writes that he was in love with writing, but he was initially too shy to call himself a writer, and he became a medical student instead, just because he didn't accept himself and his love of writing. Similarly, he writes about accepting his way of writing, he gives a very interesting explanation of why his writing lacks intensity and intimacy. So he says that my writing, he, know, he says, I know, my writing is not, that doesn't have that passion, intensity, and intimacy that some other writers have. And he's explain, he, gives, he gives an account of that. And his explanation is that, very interesting. He says that uh, I never received love from individuals that I was in love with. That's what he says. And that's why my way of writing became it, it um, developed into something that lacks intimacy and intensity. And I'm not sure, I myself, I'm not sure if I agree with his diagnosis, his self-diagnosis. I think there is an intimacy in him, in his work, and in his use of language. There's an intimacy in his honesty too. And there's an intimacy in his sense of humor. It's just a different kind of intimacy that maybe is not that the kind that we uh, that we typically encounter in descriptions of romantic love passionate love how i think about his writing how i think about somerset mom's writing is um, in terms of this metaphor of standing still in my mind he is a writer that stands still and then writes some writers, in contrast, some writers keep moving while they're writing. And they're moving, they're like, they're, while they're writing, they're still wrestling with that, their subject matter. Their minds aren't settled. Their minds aren't at rest about the subject matter. Somerset Mom begins writing once he is already settled. He has already been through an experience. Now he has settled, he's stable. And he has a comfortable distance away from what he is writing about. And he writes in a way that is also soothing to the reader as a result of that, that stability. A couple of things I wanted to add that really caught my um, attention 
and very I found really intriguing. I'm I'm now referring to the writing in this book that resembles um, the a collection of essays. So he's more like an essay writer also in, the, in parts of the book. So for example, he describes the audience of of uh, theater, and he, the way he describes them is that he thinks about the audience, the the group of people, as one character, one singular character. And he says that you should re disregard the individuals in that crowd, in the audience, in the theater audience. And you should think about them instead as one individual, one character, not a collection of individuals, but one individual. And that you should think about that individual in terms of a taste, in terms of an attention span. The, the audience as a whole has an attention span that you can actually estimate. The audience as a whole has an intelligence that you can estimate. And it has a distinct preference that maybe emerges out of the preferences of individuals who participate in it, but it becomes its own thing. And it's partly a, partly a result of a fruit of the culture of a time and the interaction with the, the creative artists and their playwrights. So I found uh, that discussion really interesting. Another thing, he argues that using verse in, in play, in plays, uh, has a has a special role. He says that uh, using verse facilitates suspension of disbelief. So instead of prose, when characters, instead of prose that is realistic, instead they speak in verse. And this might be, his argument here might be applicable to musical theater as well, or opera. When characters are not using ordinary prose, what happens is that uh, we, we feel a sharp contrast, a sharp boundary between the world inside the play and the world outside of the play. Because the characters in the play talk in a way that is very different. They talk in verse or they sing. And because of that contrast of what happens inside, how things happen inside the play, because of that, that sharp boundary, an audience can clearly cross the boundary and enter into the world of the, uh, the, world of the play, get, get immersed better because of the boundary because the boundary is well-defined with the help of features like verse. Okay, so that was also, uh, I found that to be very plausible. Final thing, I want to give you a sample of what you will find in the book. Now I'm reading from chapter 20. In my copy, it is on page uh, 44. Okay, he's now writing about humor, sense of humor. Okay, let's read. A sense of humor leads you to take pleasure in the discrepancies of human nature. It leads you to mistrust great professions and look for the unworthy motive that they conceal. The disparity between appearance and reality diverts you and you are apt when you cannot find it or create it. Find it to create it, I'm not sure. You tend to close your eyes to truth, beauty and goodness. So with a, with a very strong sense of humor, this is what happens. You tend to close your, your eyes to truth, beauty, and goodness, these noble, grand things, because they give no scope to your sense of the ridiculous. The humorist has a quick eye for the humbug. He does not always recognize the saint, but if to see men one-sidedly is a heavy price to pay for a sense of humor, there is a compensation that has a value too. You are not angry with people when you laugh at them. Humor teaches tolerance, and the humorist, with a smile and perhaps a sigh, is more likely to shrug his shoulders than to condemn. He does not moralize. He is content to understand. And it is true that to understand is to pity and forgive. I chose to read that because it... Um, it is a very representative sample. It's a little sample of Somerset, Somerset Mom's temperament as a writer, his own temperament. He is a humorist. Not in the sense of making you laugh in every page, but in the sense of prioritizing, understanding, and accepting and forgiving, um, over blaming and so forth. All right. 
um, I hope that um, you are also reading books that you're enjoying. I, I, I hope that you also have enough time to enjoy the things, activities that you enjoy doing, devoting yourself to things like reading. For me, it is. Fortunately, I still have some time to read, but uh, not as much as I want to. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for watching if you're, if you're with me until now, and I will speak with you in future videos. Thanks.